Hi, everybody. I'm Kathleen DeRose. I'm the director of the Fubon Center for Technology, Business, and Innovation. And I'm absolutely delighted and thrilled to welcome you to this fireside chat with Kyle Cogger, senior product owner of Revolut. Before we get started, a quick housekeeping note. We are going to have a Q&A session at the end of this wonderful talk led by Liz Chen. So please put your questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen and please don't use the chat. So let's turn it over to talking with Kyle about Revolut. Welcome, Kyle. I'm so glad you're here to talk to us tonight. Hi, thanks for having me, Kathleen. Cool. So first of all, let's start with what is Revolut? Sure. So Revolut is a banking app. Uh, we, we actually do a, quite a few things, but uh, right now my team, we're primarily focused on retail banking. Um, Revolut also has a Revolut for Business app as well. Um, we offer uh, a variety of banking features uh, to both consumers and businesses. Cool. So I want to get into a little bit more about you know what Revolut does, and but first let's talk about Kyle. So let's talk about who Kyle Cogger is. And when we were preparing for this chat, you were telling me a few stories about kind of how you got into fintech and your background, and some of the companies you worked at, and also some of the places you worked. And I'd just love for you to share with the audience a few of those stories about how you kind of built your fintech expertise around the world. Yeah, so it's it's quite a long and storied tale, but um, I sort of, I actually fell into fintech. I don't think I necessarily um, went guns blazing for it. Uh, I was going for technology, but I'd never really thought about fintech. Uh, but yeah, just to start sort of at the beginning, I, um, I started, I uh, did my master's degree uh, at Ivy uh, Business School in international business. Uh, and while I was there, I actually did an internship for Mutut Finance, which ended up taking me to India, living in Kochi for a summer, uh, working for Mutut Finance on their ATM deployment. Uh, that was kind of my first foray into uh, the financial space. Um, this is really like, uh, it's actually an incredibly eye-opening experience for me, just living and working in India and understanding how all of my notions around work life were really centered around the culture that I was from. And so being from Canada, I had a lot of preconceived notions as to what it meant and, and realized that uh, in the world, there are a lot of different places uh, and different mindsets around working. Uh, so after I, I uh, spent the time in India, I came back, started doing a, a few projects for Nokia on small cell deployment. So it was another technology focused uh, kind of deployment project. Uh, and then after uh, finishing up with them and finishing up my uh, degree at Ivy, moved over to uh, Copenhagen uh, with some friends from my master's program and started working for Maersk, the shipping and energy giant. Um, well, actually, it was shipping and energy giant now. Now it's just shipping. Uh, and I worked in the management consulting division for them, uh, working on a number of different uh, digital projects. And I became sort of a digital specialist within the MMC division uh, and then started working on uh, a number of projects across the group. Uh, as Marisk at the time was undergoing and is still undergoing this day, uh, digitalization transformation. Uh, and so there's a great number of projects and I got to work on a bunch of them. Uh, and, I, and I sort of started creeping into fintech as I uh, worked on trade facilitation, uh, a platform that was originally called From2, um, which really aimed to help small businesses uh, trade goods uh, and find European buyers for their goods. Uh, so helping, uh, we started in Kenya, so helping the Kenyan economy uh, there. Uh, so obviously the, the benefit to Marisk at the time was if you up, up the trade volumes from the country, you naturally upgrade or up the, the volumes of container shipments. Uh, and then that actually spawned a um, uh, financial marketplace spinoff uh, that provided trade financing to the same SMEs. Um, and so that's kind of where I first got into it. I then moved from Denmark over to back over to Canada into Vancouver uh, and started working for Instant Financial and uh, started working in the space. Uh, it's earned wage access. And what that means is basically providing hourly workers and low income workers with access to their pay immediately after their shift. So disrupting the two week pay cycle. And then this from like, there, moved over to Revolut. This is, this is like, it's an amazing journey. So for our audience or anybody thinking in a career in fintech, you've got Nokia, you've got Maersk, you've got Kenya, you've got India. And so all roads lead to fintech. Very cool. So this, yeah. obviously, 
this obviously has informed your, you know, your current career and what you're most focused on now. And you've got a big remit. So you're the head of product, senior product owner for expansion and Revolut's expanding dramatically right now. And you're overseeing, you know, all of North America, Singapore, Canada, whatever. So maybe talk a little bit about your current focus. Like what is this product supposed to do for people? And, you know, how did some of these experiences inform that, whether it's, you know, bringing people in who don't have access to financial or, you know, how different things work around the world. Talk to us a little bit about what the product does and you're thinking about how that works around the world. Yeah. So I, I would say the remit is definitely big, but also there's a number of teams at Revolut working in product. I think the total uh, number of people in product right now is around uh, like 690 people. Uh, that includes developers, engineers, uh, and product people. So there's a lot of there's a lot of eyes on the product, um, and I'm not the only the only one. Uh, fortunately, uh, I think it would be a quite overwhelming if I was. Um, but my my. My um, my objective in, in my position at Revolut is really to optimize uh, and find ways to win in these markets. So traditionally, we've done very well in Europe and we've, we've grown quite uh, exponentially in the European space, but that we don't take that for granted. So we don't expect that when we roll out to a new market that we're naturally just going to become a leader, right? Because the proposition to Europe and for Europeans uh, is a little bit different than the one that we need to win in in, in North America, the one in that we need to uh, win in in Japan. So uh, it, it's really about getting this like local market knowledge and understanding how we're going to win there. Uh, and that's very broad based. So that goes from everything from like fin, uh, uh, fin crime controls all the way to what is a new feature that we need in order to uh, to win in the market or to gain traction. So uh, it is it is quite the the scope. It's very very large breadth. Uh, the depth I get to rely on a lot of other teams uh, to help build that. So when we talk like adapting infrastructure, we have a core payments team that does that for each specific market, and they match up with our expansion team, and we'll end up being often the more front end element to implementing uh, their features. So just to kind of put this in buckets for, for folks, you've got a uh, front end that you've got to customize for kind of local conditions. You've got regulators that vary around the world. And then you've got oh, a yeah. back end you're plugging into. So Definitely. maybe just describe a little bit kind of what defines the differences in those things. So you've got three buckets, like front end is going to be you know, some kind of cultural preference. Let's just talk about each of those buckets and what differentiates things around the world. I think that'd be really interesting. Yeah. So, okay. There's, there's quite a bit. I, th I think there's even more than three buckets, but okay. uh, yeah. So there let's, let's do the retail bucket. So the retail bucket is um, like the interface, the consumer uh, app interface where we build uh, features for, for uh, customers uh, and that we have, um, we have both an iOS and an Android app. Uh, so let's just focus on retail, uh, iOS and Android app. That actually runs on the retail API. So as we move into back end, we have the retail API, which is still really focused on delivering those features. We also then have like core payments infrastructure. So the infrastructure that exists in Europe doesn't, it's like Swift isn't the same as ACH in, in the US, right? So you have to adapt to those, those systems and make sure that it's working and it should work on the front end very similarly, but the back end is completely different, right? So- just pause, pause there and just ask a question about that. So that means if you're sending, you know, pounds to UK, the time it takes for that payment from the time of sending to the time of receipt is going to vary based on you know whatever country you're in, uh, and which what payment method you you opt to choose, right? So Revolut has a peer-to-peer -peer payment feature where we can send money from a USD account into a GBP account, uh, like a Revolut GBP account, instantly. So we have in uh, infrastructure, our own infrastructure as well that we leverage to to provide these features um, that work on the backbone of the infrastructure in the local markets. Okay. And then around the world, this, you've got different competitive conditions too. So what's it like yeah. to compete with, you know, Alipay versus, I don't know, transfer wise? It's, it's actually, it's honestly crazy. And I think uh, a lot of our competitors are doing some really awesome things. And uh, fortunately, uh, our BI, uh, our business intelligence department is very skilled uh, and they give us lots of great updates as things that we're missing or that our competitors are doing or how we could think differently about it uh, based on their benchmarks. So we do a lot of benchmarking. We have a lot of data on our competitors and we're constantly tracking what they're doing to make sure that we're doing 
uh, our part to make sure our customers have the best experience and, and best in-class uh, experience uh, compared to our competitors. Um, so I think it, it's quite tricky, right? Because you have like uh, alternative payment methods in say China and uh, India, whereas you have like the traditional rails in Europe and uh, and uh, North America. So I think it's really, what I love about it is that it creates this like really integrated um, view that you can benchmark against like cross market benchmarks, right? So the Venmo in, um, in the US or let's say even like Square in the US for payments, right? You have mobile pay in Denmark, you have M-Pesa in, um, in Kenya. So it's just like, I think trying to get and integrate that view uh, is really important because uh, oftentimes a lot of innovation can be borrowed from uh, in one market can be borrowed from another. Now this, I think that's a key insight about FinTech too, about how portable some of these ideas have become, but also how a little bit hostage they are to the local, you know, the local setup. One question yeah. I'm super curious about, and I'm sure our audience is too, but um, the movement of money around the world, are you seeing any patterns in terms of, you know, most popular, you know, currencies? Is that just a function of, you know, who's on your app or are, is there something else going on? And the reason I'm asking that is that some people think that, you know, Alipay will, will internationalize the Remimbi with, with the Alipay app. What's going on there in terms of worldwide currency movements? Do tell. Uh so yeah, so actually, I, get, I love making the parallel between remittance flows and trade flows because um, they're very they can be very similar. Mm -hmm. um, so remittance flows uh, they traditionally follow uh, the relationships that the customers have um, in real life, mm -hmm. right? So uh, if you think about the U.S. market specifically, right, there are a lot of Mexican immigrants um, and a huge Latam population, so. Uh, naturally, the Mexican remittance corridor is is very high um, in terms of volume and count of remittances. Uh, in addition, uh, so there's also a, quite a large population of uh, Chinese in uh, in the U.S. as well, right? And so you also see that. So um, it's very similar with uh, trade flows, actually. So, for example, in Kenya, um, the uh, largest like trading relationship is with uh, like they they were colonized right so there's a relationship with uh, UK and with Netherlands uh, and you see a lot of the trade flows actually mimic historical patterns and and existing relationships between businesses and between people in these markets so I'd say it's fintech mirrors life in terms of the relationships between uh, like remittance flows. It's a super interesting comment. What about the impact of the pandemic on some of these movements? Have there been any you know, notable changes there that you guys have seen? Um, in remittance flows, uh, not so much spending. I think spending, we noticed a huge drop in spending right at the pandemic, like the height of um, sort of the anxiety around it. Uh, you, you started to see uh, a reduction in spend, but that rebounded actually quite quickly, a lot quicker than I anticipated. Um, and that just kind of goes with like general sentiment, right? So again, it's mirroring how people are, like people's behaviors always mirror um, their beliefs, right? So um, we saw that rebound. We saw a lot of um, focus. It's pretty typical, but I'll even more indexed towards like uh, food um, as the primary spend because people are home, they're cooking for themselves, right? Uh, obviously, transportation um, went down a little bit because people weren't really traveling. So it's, it's very uh, intuitive as to what you would think ex uh, or expect to happen. Makes sense. So goes, kind of going back to Revolut's overall strategy and vision and expanding kind of product feature set, maybe mm -hmm. just explain a little bit to us, first of all, before we get into that, how does Revolut make money? Yeah, so um, I pre prepared for this because um, I, I wanted to make sure I got it right and I didn't uh, misspeak or anything like that. So I'm going to focus on the um, the fees for retail banking, mm -hmm. um, there are uh, keep in mind there are different teams. Like for example, a trading team, a crypto team, um, the business team. These are different. They have different fees um, associated with those particular products. Mm -hmm. For the retail product, it's it's very straightforward. Um, so depending on whether you're a uh, standard or a um, paid user, so we have or a customer, you have 
metal and premium, right? So there'll, there'll be a pro- predominantly a subscription fee. That's where we would earn a majority of our, our uh, money on those uh, subscription clients. But um, for the standard uh, customer, uh, we earn money in a couple different ways. The most predominant one uh, is interchange fees. This is true across whether you're paid or subscription. Uh, the interchange fees in different markets are, it's it's like a good business in some markets and not a good business in others. So the interchange fees are one of those things that vary by market. Um, that's probably the biggest one. Uh, there's uh, some things that I'll note that are free that you probably would just want to be considered I could like consider it of um, adding money is free. Um, the only time we ever charge for adding money is when we're imposed a fee for adding money. We never uh, charge for adding to the ecosystem. Um, your first Revolut card uh, is free. You may need to pay a delivery fee based on which market that you're in. Um, Oftentimes, this is comped, though, uh, and not required, um, or you don't have to pay for that. Replacement cards are charged for. So uh, your first card is free, but if you um, if you lose your card and have to keep purchasing, because there are some people who end up having to buy like 14 cards, um, it, is, it is a cost for the business. So we do pass that cost on to customers. Uh, if you're a metal user, though, for example, uh, your subscription covers your first free replacement. Uh, and then okay. after that, we do charge. Basically like subscription model plus, um, you know, some interchange fees. And are you guys, are you guys like transfer wise, are you um, pooling and netting foreign currency around the world? Yeah, so we we do add um, like we we essentially try not to add any markup onto our like a majority of currencies. So um, we what we end up doing with um, FX is that uh, if you for a majority of currencies like USD, GBP, uh, Euro, Australian dollars, Canadian dollars, uh, and so on, there's a number of them. Those are all free to exchange within market hours. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so we don't add any additional markup on that. Um, for uh, specific currencies like Thai bot, um, there there is a markup of like one percent. Um, cryptocurrencies uh, are charged two and a half percent. That's for the standard plan. Um, again, like I said, if you transact outside of market hours, uh, we do have to add a, a fee, uh, an additional fee on that. So some of the percentages. Uh, like for example, the ones that were free go to 0.5%. Okay. So, so obviously part of the value prop here is that, you know, you guys are like way below, you know, travel X obviously, uh, at the, at the airport and then probably below your, below your local bank. Um, yeah, definitely below your local bank. <laughs> and so, so in terms of just this currency risk, if you guys, if there is, you know, long exposure anywhere around the world, um, you know, how do you guys think about that actually? As a, yeah. So we, yeah, like I, the thing is, is that we have uh, accounts like across the world. So uh, I think uh, overall our exposure is managed. That's done by our, our risk team. Um, so not really, I'm not the best person to talk to about that. Um, but we do hold, uh, we have like a number of accounts and, and have money in each of those and earn revenue in each of those countries. Um, so some of the, like the fluctuations of where one goes up and the other goes down, we end up kind of netting out because, you know, we're, we're in all these currencies anyway. Oh, cool. That, that, that makes sense. It's an di- interesting and different business model, though, than, you know, um, uh, bilateral types of, of, of transfers that used to exist. I want to mm-hmm. turn a little bit to, you know, some of your early experience around the world and yeah. what's happening on, on the front end that you're, you're really handling right now in terms of building this product out. So we're, we're in the point in time in fintech where we're really starting to see the ability to shape behavior. And so I just, I want to talk a little bit about that because part of the promise of FinTech was to like sweep people into the system and make, yeah. make finance more accessible, transparent, cheaper, easier to use. So let's talk about how Revolut's doing that and you know, how, how you guys are like guiding people or, or you know, what you're telling them to do on this app. Yeah, so I think it's not so much like telling them what to do. I think um, it's around empowering them to do the things that they already want to do and to do them easier. Um, so, yeah, it's, I mean, the way I look at it, like some of the features we're working on right now, so we're trying to um, uh, basically have a best-in-class uh, bill payment and bill management um, 
uh, service. So one of the features we just launched, for example, is that we know that customers, especially like our European customers, the idea came from Europe, uh, are like subscribed to a number of different products, right? So they subscribe to Netflix, they subscribe to Amazon Prime, they do uh, like different videos, like even Hulu, we have Hulu. There's so many now that it's hard to keep track of. And the reality is, is that people are actually losing track of the the subscriptions that they've signed up to or the the trials that they've done and they put in their credit card or they put in yeah. their debit card and and then they lose track and then all of a sudden they they look at the end of the month and they've been charged like ten dollars 20 times and and then they're like what i, I i'm out uh i'm out two hundred dollars um and so what we uh, one of our, our card payments team, they, they developed a feature uh, for subscription detection uh, and blocking of uh, subscription payments. So uh, if you say see something coming out of your account, we'll one, warn you that you the next payment is likely on this date. Uh, so if you want to take action, you can block this payment now so that you, you don't need to get charged the next month. So it puts it, what I love about FinTech and what I love about like a feature like that is it puts the, the consumer back in control mm -hmm. where, you know, businesses kind of like a lot of subscription businesses are, were originally designed to like get the payment and then keep you locked in because you're yes. less likely to change. And so we're kind of like tilting that on its head again and saying like, no, you're, you're still in control regardless of this. So I, I really like that because I think the average person can really benefit a lot from it. I could hear the argument already that the money you save from canceling subscriptions clearly pays for that Revolut subscription. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you can do it even for free, right? So you use the free account and you get all that. That's like a feature that's stock. We don't charge for it. Um, we just really, I think at the heart of Revolut, we really care about our customers and we want to make sure that um, no one is being taken advantage of, advantage of in their financial lives. And so a lot of what we do is really trying to, to make sure that it's easy to be a good and financially healthy person. So let's talk a little bit about kind of the decisions people are making on there because there's, you know, one thing about paying a bill, but as you guys move up the food chain and add features, you're going to be involved in people's maybe more complex financial choices. Talk a little bit about that and how you might consider using like behavioral finance to maybe shape some of those decisions. Yeah, so I think it's, uh, we have some very, we have lots of very impressive people, but I think our data scientists are probably some of the most impressive people at Revolut. Um, and so they are, are always like monitoring behavior. So with things that we're marketing to customers to do, uh, even with the existing product suite that we have now, um, it's, it's, a, it's a learning model. So we get better at it each time that it works and each time that it doesn't. Um, I'd say for these larger, more complex, so it, it both applies to the simple products as much as it applies to the complex products um, in the sense that you need to be recommending um, these products for users at times that make sense, at times where they will, uh, they want to look at them and they are going to convert, right? So, um, I think the the basis and like we're we're at kind of like I'd say foundational steps for for recommendation and it's going to get a lot uh, more sophisticated over the next year or so. Um, there's some great work. Uh, we have some internal names that I'm like trying to hold back from saying the names of the them because we named them, but uh, but yeah. So I, I I'd say that you have to look at every single micro decision uh, and you have to look at it uh, repeated over time and then it gets better and better. And then I think you start to develop this like suite of uh, recommendation engine uh, for, for Revolut. So. so so one of the cool things about, about FinTech is the possibility that we really could guide people to decisions that are better for their financial health. And that's, that's pretty exciting. Oh, yeah. uh, and I'm just wondering though, like we're, we're kind of getting an object lesson literally as we speak and the downside of customized views, uh, certainly on social media, that hasn't yeah. really come to finance yet, but you can feel it creeping in. What are you guys doing to anticipate and maybe protect uh, your users from getting that kind of polarized view, like for example, you know, of a marketplace or a financial choice, um, yeah. where they're not really getting um, you know, the, true, the true spectrum of choices? Yeah, so that's actually, I'd say we're, we're almost doing the opposite, right? So we want, it's, we wanted like, provide financial literacy, uh, but not just by like edu because typically financial literacy was like very education focused. Right. Um, but really what it should be is 
Yeah, it should be both educational, but it should also be uh, just easier to use and to understand, right? So even like on on micro decisions for the product, like copy on specific things, there's actually like uh, we'll have a call of thirty people and we'll we'll discuss what we're labeling something as because we don't think it's as intuitive, right? So I think um, to get back to the original point, I think it's really um, important to make it easy for for consumers to both see and understand the products that they have available to them, but also understand the ones that they, they haven't yet viewed and making those a lot easier so that it takes some of the intimidation out. And a lot of like, for example, buying crypto with Revolut or buying stocks, which we don't have yet in the US, are it's a lot easier than it is anywhere else, right? And, and that's kind of, in our mind, it's, it's how it should be. It, it seems like it's the fact that it's so difficult to get into it, and there's so many barriers to entry for a customer, it just makes no sense. It should be quite simple. So we're really trying to do that and break down that and make it more, uh, make it a lot easier so that, that you have that um, proliferation of products for customers. So what, um, what's the kind of the dumbest decision that people make that you've seen on the app and how does that vary around the world? Um, Ooh, uh, the dumbest decision. Um, Financial decision. Well, I'd say, I'd say like, I, I can't say for Revolut specifically, but I think this, like the pairing the card thing, the adding about 50, like I think at one of my last companies at Instant Financial, um, there was a customer who had lost 15 cards in six months. And I, I was like so tempted to call them up and say like, hey, like why, why, like, why is this happening, right? But I mean, obviously couldn't do that. So um yeah, so I think it's a lot of this, like, uh, you can kind of tell this, like, some that some customers aren't, um, like in my past, and some customers aren't really uh, being vigilant about their finances. And so, like, you leave your cards lying around, you have to deactivate those cards. It's just a lot, uh, it's a lot of exposure. So, <laughs> yeah, I think that for me is, a, I always wonder what kind of headspace the, the customer's in when they lose 15 cards. Is there like a, a like a common American mistake versus a common like Euro European mistake or anything like that? Um, I'd say, well, for one, I think a lot of Americans actually, uh, they pay like, so Revolut's traction for uh, FX products in, in the US, I think is, uh, we're under indexed for the market so far. So if you actually look at it, banks are charging 3% uh, markup. Right. So we have this feature, like we have features that basically make it easier and less expensive. So not only can you send it instantaneously, but you also aren't charged uh, and you get it at the interbank exchange rate. So um, for me, it's like kind of a no brainer to do all of your FX through Revolut. Um, and so I think for me is like not seeing the traction for that is like, it's a little bit mind blowing to me as to why. And so I, what, I, what I see like the overarching takeaway is that people are really ingrained in the behaviors that they have already set, right? So there's like switching inertia for banks. There's, it's how I've always done it. This is the bank that my, my mom and dad got me, so I'm not switching. So all of that kind of stuff is what's the frustration point for me. What about, what about just the demographics of your users? Are you getting the typical pattern of kind of the young male early adopter or could you talk about that? And also how does that vary around the world? Yeah. So um, to be honest, I don't want to give any misinformation and I, I haven't looked at these in a, in a bit, but if I talk about the segments, maybe more so than the, the actual, like um, the age, I mean, we do, we are typically skewed to younger, uh, the younger segment. Um, but in terms of like who we focus on for um, like who are Revolut users, we're really looking at um, basically the, those people who are um, like challengers. So they, they're frustrated with the, the traditional banking system. They, they feel like challenger banks are, are the way to go. Um, not that Revolut is a challenger bank, but that uh, they're just, they have this mindset. Um, I'd say uh, then we also have these like uh, the underserved. So the those customers who in the U.S. are like underbanked. So it's, uh, I think it's like 23% of the U.S. is on or underbanked, right? And so this segment is obviously like, I mean, we would be kind of remiss if we didn't look at this segment because they're they're underserved as it, is, as it stands. And then you also see there's like a, a higher immigrant population 
uh, in this segment as well. And and if like we talked about at the beginning, that that fintech kind of mirrors life in the sense that they're sending and remitting money home. It's it's a natural fit for that segment um, as well. So yeah, I, I'd say like w- there's different areas that we serve because we have like such a broad product suite, right? So like our, our investment product is really good for the, like, um, the like up and coming, um, like professional segment, because it's like a really easy way to step into stock trading. And that's what people are interested in it. So it's like different products inside Revolut are matched up to different personas. Okay. Got got it. Makes sense. So you guys have got like a classic kind of segmentation type of thing going on. Yeah. So what about, um, you sort of alluded to this earlier when you're talking about machine learning and recommender systems, but you guys are like a fountain of data now. And uh, obviously that's, that's something pretty interesting. Um, could you talk a little bit about your plans there and whether you're, you're really using you know, traditional data, but maybe also unstructured data, how you're thinking about that and um, what, you know, what, what gates you're putting on yourselves, if any, in terms of just the proliferation of AI in these financial apps? Yeah, so I'd say, um, so first on the proliferation of AI, um, it's segmented to different teams and there's different AI for different purposes, right? So um, you can have uh, like financial crime AI, uh, you can have uh, like um, obviously the marketing recommendation engine AI, right? So there's there's a lot of that. I think to talk more about the, the data, um, so I think it's really important like when you sit on this data that you don't, it's it's really, it's important to make decisions that are in line with it and to use it uh, to your advantage to make sure you're making good decisions, right? So, and at, at Revolut, this actually comes into something that I was hoping to touch on, which is the, um, the, the building and systemization of a company. So making processes more systematized, like uh, Revolut is incredibly good at this. Uh, and so there's data on not just the customers, not just different product flows, like for example, onboarding flow is one. We have uh, different product suites like crypto, uh, like card spend, uh, trading, all of that. We have each of that uh, data for that. And you can cross use that. So if you notice that somebody's like very active in trading, you may also want to recommend the savings product that we have that has um, a, a savings bonus of four and a half percent that's coming uh, this week. So. Um, we look at that and we say, okay, like how can we use and leverage that data? But I think more importantly, it's about the system with which we access that um, and making it uh, incredibly easy for a revoluter um, or a Revolut employee to access that and make decisions with that. So we have a whole system and infrastructure in place and tools in place to make that very easy. And, and my team right now is working on making sure that each market has reusable insights so that they can also make recommendations for their market. So um, it's really about, uh, you know, making it fundamental to how you make decisions, not just how AI is making decisions. So this is, a, a, I think, a really interesting point for the audience to compare, contrast, you know, big, mature fintech 10 years into the fintech revolution, if you want to call it that, versus, you know, big incumbents. And just talk a little bit about where we are, because 10 years ago, it looked like it was, oh, these are the, the Vikings storming the ramparts, you know, taking over the incumbents, just big disruptors. Now there's more partnerships, but there's also developments like you just described, which, you know, are really advanced thinking about how to run a business. What's going mm-hmm. on in, you know, big company, small competitor, fintech right now? Yeah. So if I were to summarize it, I would say that it's product thinking throughout the entire business. And maybe that's me overestimating product um, a little bit. I'm biased. uh, What can I say? Uh, But really having a product approach to uh, everything that you do in the business. So uh, for us, um, like even from managing our our balance sheet and our financials, right, that's all online um, and in a shared tool, right? so uh, just to go back maybe a little bit uh, larger scope, right? So the difference between the big, uh, the big, and, and the thing is, is that Revolut is big, but it's still a startup. Um, so it's still, uh, it's only five years old. Um, so if that blows, that should blow your mind uh, if, it, if you didn't know that before, because um, 13 million users today. So um yeah, so I'd say the the um, the startups, like the the bigger startups versus the smaller startups. The mm-hmm. bigger startups, what they have figured out is 
how to build uh, momentum is how I would describe it, right? And how you build momentum is based off infrastructure architectural decisions that allow you to make faster decisions, develop faster, uh, and all of these these challenging um, things that you sacrifice, I think, in the smaller in the smaller startups, you sacrifice quality a little bit mm-hmm. for speed. But what that what you don't realize is that that's a short termistic speed. So that's getting the and this one product out, not getting many products out all at once. And what Revolut has done has made it really systematized in terms of delivering product and doing that not just in the retail banking space, not just in business banking space but also in uh, our internal, like even HR project management space, all of this stuff is automated so that we just track towards our goals and, and everything is there to support us in delivering uh, and in achieving an outcome rather than us spending time trying to collate all of this together. Now, this is a really interesting point about kind of the, the modern day corporation and the future of work that's t- totally worth contemplating. And it, it kind of leads me to my next question, which is, you know, we're a, a center for innovation at a business school. So what's that, you know, what's that amazing super course that every aspiring, you know, fintech entrepreneur, investor, uh, leader should, should take? Uh, yeah, the super course. I would say it's, the school, it's actually the school of hard knocks. I'd say um, the one thing is grit. Uh, and that's one thing that every single Revolut employee has. Uh, everyone that I've ever seen successful in business. Um, so depending on where you are at in your career, I think uh, it just becomes more and more apparent the longer that you've been working. Uh, and for really high caliber companies, you start to see this in spades and that's they're hiring people based off grit. And what I mean by grit is this, I think business school often teaches you <laughs> a little bit like do X, get an A, right? So like, do your paper, get an A, do this assignment, get an A, participate in class, get an A. That's all one-to-one, right? But the reality is like the world does not work that way and payout is not instantaneous. Delayed gratification is the norm. And so you need to understand that you have to put in work and work and work and work and work until you see some outcome. Um, and I think for me, that's the one thing that I, I try to like anybody I mentor or or talk to is just re- remember why you're doing it and don't expect an outcome right away. Just try to, just try to like make it better as you go and it will eventually come back to you in spades. So I'm looking, you know, in my office for the, the grit manual that I can then give to my students. I don't think that exists. I think that is, that is character or experience. <laughs> um, but you, you did hint at maybe some things we should really think about being a core part of the curriculum, which is the data science aspect that, you know, finance has become data science driven. So, yeah. So if we talk actual courses for sure, like what you should be focused on one, I think internationalization or international business is very, very important, right? Because the world is uh, hyper globalized now and it's continuing every day. Uh, So definitely be abreast on uh, like internationalization for business. I think the other thing is definitely data science. Um, if you can, if, if you're going into any uh, tech company, you need da- data science, you need SQL, you need to have a strong control of data. Yeah, no, I think, I think that's, that's cool. So um, I want to just talk about the flip side of that culture. So you guys are known for being like super KPI driven. And, yeah. you know, there is this kind of um, concern about the Silicon Valley kind of bro-ish culture that, you know, is maybe less accessible for different types of people and so forth. And, you know, you guys have had your own headlines about some of that stuff. Um, can you just address that? How do you, what's the balancing act between, you know, really driving towards a goal, especially as a young company versus, you know, going too far over in, into the, you know, the KPI driven um, processes and stuff. Yeah. So I think um, what I would say is that I think for Revolut, uh, KPI is you setting your goal. What are you trying to achieve? What is really going to, what are you trying to move the needle on, right? Because then everything kind of falls into place as you work on it, right? So you, if, if it's not contributing to this, then obviously it's not going to be a priority for you, right? So it's really more around setting priorities and having a way to set priorities across the business and make that easy. I think from a cultural perspective, yes, we, we're KPI driven. Yes, we want to drive output. Yes, it's fintech, so it's it's uh, can be intense. Yes, you need to be on your game, right? 
I think it's not suited for everyone. Uh, and just like fintech, I, my experience in fintech is very similar to my experience at Revolut. So there, I don't really differentiate between the two. Um, so I would say that fintech is not for everybody. It's not for the faint of heart. It's not for, um, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's just, it's not, you can't skate by, right? You, you really are, you're held accountable, right? And so I think um, from that in that regard, uh, that's very uh, typical for the industry as a whole. I'd say for culture, uh, Revolut, it's really important for Revolut um, right now with like uh, just in the wake, not, not just in the wake of BLM, but uh, diversity and inclusion, right? We have a lot of uh, international uh, employees joining in that. And so that is, um, I know that the people, uh, the people ops in Revolut are working uh, to improve every day and make sure that we're, we're addressing anywhere where we're falling down, um, especially in the wake of that. So I'd say just overall culture at Revolut is like, it's very typical for, for um, fintech in general uh, and really just trying to be the best uh, with everything that we're aware of. I think that's, that's such a cool, uh, it almost brings us full circle to where we started the conversation and your background and really talking about the experiences you had around the world and financial inclusion. I think it's a, an awesome point in this conversation to, to pause and to really um, think about taking some questions. So I just want to introduce uh, Liz Chen, who's the assistant director of the Fubon Center, and she's going to moderate our our Q&A section. So if you do have a question and you've, you've, you've thrown it in the Q&A, we'll, uh, we'll take those now. So Liz, over to you. Thank you very much, Kathleen. Um, Kyle, I have a question from Joseph. He asks, what competitive advantages does upstart fintech companies like Revolut have over existing payment companies? You mentioned something about your analytics. Can you provide a more concrete example and explanation? Sure. Um, okay, so the first part of that question was around what our competitive advantage is, right? Um, so I'd say, uh, honestly, our competitive advantage is our people. Our composition inside Revolut is a lot different than the uh, like incumbent banks or payment uh, existing payment companies. So uh, we think a lot differently around uh, what is fintech and what is it that we're trying to do. So that that I would say is like our core competitive advantage inside each individual product has its own uh, like subset of uh, of uh, unique value propositions that we have. Um, and and they they do they are specific to products uh, like I've been mentioning crypto, uh, trading, retail, uh, all of those are are um, unique. Uh, in terms of the analytics, the concrete example. Um, so what I can say is that uh, we have a store of databases. I can get access to any database in Revolut uh, within minutes, uh, and then I can start to write queries that. Uh, that I can basically publish and reuse publicly within like an hour. Uh, it's just, it's basically limited by the time it takes me to write a query or the time it takes my team to write a query. Um, and so then once we have that, we can actually flip and reuse that by each market. Um, and so then all of a sudden, something that would have taken uh, repeatedly an hour's worth of work uh, and you would have been like, okay, it's fine. It's just an hour, right? But it's an hour every week for the foreseeable future, right? So like this is where we start to gain some crazy efficiencies because we have market, um, we're analyzing our own product across markets and finding insights over time spot uh, and seeing what, what we need to do and w what decisions we need to take and what, what uh, problems we need to fix uh, and how urgent they are. And we have all of that insight available uh, right uh, easily accessible as soon as you like have written the query, if it's already in existence, it's there immediately for anyone to use. That's great, thank you. Um, I have a question from uh, several of our attendees. Um, there's one from Uman and uh, Nev. They're basically asking about um, switching to a new financial product. So the question is, how do you handle the skepticism around switching to a new financial product, especially when money is involved and people might have concerns around safety and security in moving away from uh, traditional banking? Um, and also to add to that question is, you know, how is Revolut attracting these new customers? Yeah. So, um, okay. So I'm going to answer the first one, uh, which is, uh, how do we address some of the skepticism? Uh, so one marketing, um, we need to make sure that, 
Uh, we're clearly communicating uh, our security uh, is one. And I know that that's actually especially prominent in uh, the U.S., concerns around security. Um, but we also have received feedback in the U.K. Uh, and Europe as well uh, around that. Uh, so I think it's very clear communication. I also think making it as easy as possible to onboard is another thing. So every single person you put in at the top of the funnel does not equal one person uh, at the end of the onboarding funnel, right? So our job is also to optimize every single user who's uh, or customer who's signing up, making sure that we get as many of them through uh, the entire onboarding funnel as possible. So making it as seamless as possible. I think uh, to the second question around um, the uh, like, how are we attracting them? So uh, like I alluded to, we have a four and a half percent savings bonus coming out. Um, this week, we have these new unique features around subscription management. Um, we have crypto, we have a lot of different. Uh, so what we're trying to be is a financial hub. So where you get everything that you need just by one app rather than a whole bunch. Um, and so we aim to leverage each and every product that we have in our product suite. And it, my, my job and other teams' jobs are also to enhance these products to make them attractive for uh, the U.S. market so, or, or a, any other market. So, um, yeah, we, we basically try to uh, look at what the competitors are doing, figure out what our niche is or where we're going to play uh, and what will differentiate us or what is going to be ultra competitive in that space and then do that and deliver that quickly so that we can start to attract customers. Okay, great. Um, I have a question from Vincent, which kind of, you know, um, jumps from what you were saying. He, he would like to know whether or not Revolut is going to grow into a one-stop shop for personal finance to include banking, credit, trading, and insurance marketplace. Yeah, so we aim to be a uh, super app, right? Uh, financial super app. So we want to eat up and do all of those things for our customers because uh, honestly, I think the Revolut way of making uh, finance simple for customers uh, is not just limited to the traditional card payment space, right? So it's also, uh, it, it can also be insurance products. It can also be uh, trading. It can also be um, a number of different things, right? And all we want to do is empower the financial lives of our customers and I'll empower them to make uh, good decisions and uh, make it easy for them. Wonderful. Um, I have a question um, from several of our guests about your competitors. Uh, there are two questions here. How do you plan to take on Apple Card that also focuses on the younger segment? And also, um, what do you think about Marcus by Goldman Sachs? Would that be your competition? Yeah, I mean, we don't really rule anybody out with our broad brush of what we're trying to um, address. Uh, we see there's a, we're making competitive comparisons off ones that aren't obvious as well, right? So, um, and in adjacent spaces and, and whatnot. So, um, yes, those are definitely our competitors, some of them. They're not all of them. Um, and I, I think there there's... In my opinion, there's still plenty of room to play in uh, in the fintech space because I, I I just don't feel that it's quite saturated yet. I don't feel like anyone really has it all figured out, uh, and so it's really around looking at what they're offering, uh, sometimes mirroring or doing it better, uh, sometimes doing it completely differently, uh, and so it really depends on a case by case basis of how we approach these issues. Uh, and, and these are done not just at the product team level, but also done by uh, like Nick and Vlad uh, and our, our heads of product. They're, they're also looking at this uh, and business intelligence as well. So there's a number of different competitors and decisions to be made. Um, so I, sorry, I can't give a more concrete example, but, um, but yeah, we, we definitely look at them. We definitely want to compete with them. Uh, in which ways? TBD. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a question from Daniel, and he asks, as part of the B2C retail side of the business, do you focus on all global regions or are the product team each taking B2C retail regions like Europe, Europe or APAC? Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, there, that's a good question because then we can kind of highlight the structure of Revolut, right? So we have these uh, core uh, HQ teams. So they run the traditional flow. So the ones that are going to be like rolled out on mass scale. So we have 
uh, things like payments, uh, like the payments flow, so peer-to-peer -peer, uh, transfers, that kind of stuff. Um, we have uh, onboarding. Uh, there's an onboarding PO. We have um, card payments. We have uh, acquiring integrations. We have a number of different, like I could probably go on for days, right? We have bit, uh, cryptocurrencies and trading teams and all of them. So uh, there's these core uh, core teams that build like the main uh, sort of foundation, right? And then those each are like modules that we roll out uh, to the different markets, right? So when it's ready, we have to build on the infrastructure, right? So there's time to get each of those products ready for a specific market, especially if the infrastructure is different and needs to be uh, built to to the new spec of, of the infrastructure for that market. So there are, in some cases, the HQ, uh, well, I call them HQPOs because of the, the um, sort of core functionality, they will... Uh, prioritize rolling out to specific markets as it grows their, uh, their objective for usage of that feature. Um, sometimes though, uh, it will be my team who will take and adapt those products to make them better. So uh, for the market, not better, like they're probably pretty great, but for some markets, they don't actually work, right? So um, my team actually looks at all these expansion markets. So what's included under my purview is the US market, the Canada market, Japan, Singapore, and Australia. Um, and as new markets come up, I'm sure they'll be included. Um, and so uh, it's really our job to communicate the local market knowledge to those POs, make sure that uh, as they build new features that they're thinking about this stuff, but then also um, ship product that, that works for these markets uh, and do that uh, separate from those teams as well. Thank you, thank you. Um, I have a question uh, from Manish. He asks, how has the current pandemic impacted the ability of fintechs to raise financing? Are the banks likely to acquire promising upstarts or more mature ones owing to the lack of funding? Has the competitive balance shifted to the larger players? Um, yeah, so I would say that Revolut, I can speak for Revolut, I can't speak for the industry overall, but for Revolut, we haven't had problem raising funding because I think as some of you may know, that we reopened our round of funding and got in at the same evaluation as we had in uh, February, we got that in June. Uh, after the pandemic was well underway. So for us, it has taken no impact, but I'm sure that it has for other, uh, other companies. In terms of what um, the uh, large incumbents are looking to acquire. Not really sure. Uh, to be honest, that's not Revolut's play. So we're not really looking to be acquired uh, as far as I know. And maybe I don't want to speak out of turn, but I'm pretty sure no. Um, so that I, I don't really know there, to be honest. Uh, so I'm sorry. Okay. I can't really say more than that. Um, and let's see, I have a question from Elena. As you expand into different markets, how do you balance local resources versus global HQ resources to ensure each market rollout is successful, understanding local conditions and leveraging global learnings? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, yeah, my team's like right in the thick of this, right? So we have these market teams, uh, which are really, really, um, I can't emphasize this enough, like super high caliber people. They're very impressive. <laughs> Um, and so they're, um, they run the market. And so running the market, uh, I'm coming in from a product perspective, right? So like, what does the pro what is the product launched in this market? What do we have here? How is it tracking that kind of stuff? They also need to manage the business side of it, right? So the, the gross margin, making sure that it's a profitable, uh, market for us, uh, making sure that uh, we're compliant, making sure that risk is controlled for this market. They're managing partner banks, they're managing some uh, market specific vendors. So we have a team that's right sized to, to do that in the market. Um, now, how it comes to product and products interplay. So the market teams uh, don't have product people necessarily, right? A lot of them become product people or join product teams later on, um, uh, just because they or feel so inclined, I suppose, not all of them. Um, but product is really run from um, like Revolut in, in Europe. Uh, and so it's more of like a, almost like a licensing relationship um, where we're building product for their needs uh, and then they're using it. 
Um, and so from that regard, it, there's wide coverage because there's so many different facets of, of the product itself. Um, and those are all uh, covered primarily from like a HQ central point of view. And where my team comes in is we're like the team to consolidate uh, the HQ POs and making sure that they understand local market context um, and, and that we're kind of like bridging and providing insight for them. And because I'm in all the same calls, all the same meetings as all the HQ POs, but I'm coming from an expansion perspective, oftentimes I will be asking questions to them of how they've thought about expansion or what they still need or helping them, you know, get matched up with the right person in the market to help them uh, deliver their features. So it's really like a team effort uh, because not any one person has the full overview. So you really have to come to the plate with what information you do have and try to make everything a success for both your team, but also other teams. And that's asking for help when you need it, helping somebody get help when they need it. Uh, and then uh, to capture the learnings also, sorry, just to capture the learnings, um, I am like all about confluence and making sure that everything is captured and, and then like funneled up and, and trickled up uh, into like this global uh, learning stuff. So we're, we're constantly documenting things that we find out, passing off to BI, passing off to the proper team. So the exchange of information at these uh, like learnings level happens as well, just similar to needing help for rolling out a specific feature. I think, I think that's an amazing place to, to take a pause in the conversation. Just talking about global learning. I think we've learned so much about Revolut from this conversation. So just want to give you like a really warm thank you for coming to spend the time with us this evening. It was super informative, really interesting. And I know I learned a lot. So thank you so much, Kyle. Huge uh, shout out. Thank you very much um, for, for being with us here this evening. And to everybody, thanks for joining this Fubon Fireside Chat. Thank you, Liz. Um, thanks to our tech support. And please come to our next one, which happens to be next week, and follow us on Instagram. Thanks so much for spending time with us tonight. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.